Two Guys, One Shaker Cup Podcast, hosted by Joshua Shaw and Ryan Buckeye. What's going on, everybody? Welcome inside the Two Guys, One Shaker Cup Podcast. This week's topic of conversation might get a little heated. It might get a little hot in here. <laughs> And not, not because it's the middle of summer, not because we're in the dead of the heat, but because we're speaking on a topic that I, I get fired up about, Josh. I, I mean, this is, this is right in my wheelhouse where I get fired up about companies like Herbalife, Advocare, Isogenics, all this bullshit that's out in the world today where my best friend down the street is slinging supplements from their garage <laughs> Or maybe they're selling me Rowan Fields or whatever the fuck that, that uh, makeup or the, the other, that thing's going crazy too. Multi-level marketing companies. I can't stand them in terms of the, the point within sports nutrition. I, I hate them with a passion. And we want to discuss this and talk about this today because you might not have a different perspective on like the way they're ran, but you did a video on your, on your, on your channel one time. Not, I wouldn't say not necessarily defending them, but maybe helping people understand them a little bit more. So... Dive into the world of MLMs, which are still prevalent today, although I believe uh, the FTC is making a lot of these companies kind of restructure the way they do things because it's starting to come off as a pyramid scheme. But um, my God, you know, I'm going to stop talking for a second because I, I'm just going to articulate my thoughts in my head before I blow a gasket. And I want everybody to know I, I didn't serve this one up to Ryan. I think the last couple ones that have triggered him, I've served them up uh, because I know that they do trigger him. But this one, he actually was really excited to talk about. Um, I'm not. Uh, if you guys follow him, uh, you know, for long enough on on Instagram and, and different things like that, he's he's come out with a lot of different um, passionate uh, talks about uh, MLM factual companies. passionate talks. Yeah, factual. Bash, he's you know a lot of. Um, explicit language probably so it's um you know this is hopefully we can get ryan to maybe blow a few gaskets in this uh segment i think that everybody will enjoy um seeing how uh, red and and fiery he can get on this subject but to ryan's uh point i I did make a video around herbalife and just like financials i think a lot i think there's just a lot of misunderstanding about mlm companies and i'm not you know, saying that you should be, uh, you know, starting an MLM or, or trying to create a business, whatever they call it. I, what I wanted people to know is that, you know, there's a lot of commonalities to other sports nutrition uh, businesses. Specifically, I, I talked about uh, Herbalife, and I think that there are some just distinct differences, mm. um, obviously in their in their model. But if you take just a look at some other businesses in sports nutrition. It's not as many degrees away of differentiation or um, just uniqueness as what you would think. And that's kind of what that video was about was saying, hey, you know, you hate this about MLM. But if you think about this in the sense of like a traditional sports nutrition brand, they do this. And it's actually only a few degrees off from what that is. They could a, a sports nutrition brand could just take it the full way if they wanted to. They just haven't done that yet. And I'm saying that eventually people realize that they might go in that direction because what I'll, what I'll tell people is that these brands, the ones that Ryan talked about and um, just a ton of other ones, uh, they are much bigger than traditional sports nutrition brands. Oh, they are yeah. like far and away bigger. So if you are a um, person that is really focused on uh, creating something very big and very large in the sports nutrition area, you might take a few lessons from these MLM companies because – Regardless if you hate them or you love them or whatever it is, they know how to make money. And it might not be the money and the way that you want to make money, but if you're not romantic about the way you like to make money, this might be a pretty damn good way to make a living. Well, let's talk about the similarities. Let's just throw them out there right away so people understand what are the similarities between a multi-level marketing company like Herbalife, who is the largest sports nutrition company, I believe, in the world in terms of like monetary. Are they worth like $8 billion or some crazy number like that? At one point, I think they were. They, I don't know what they are anymore. Um, yeah, I'll kind of I'll say like I looked up at the top five um, – in the U.S., this is U.S.-based uh, revenue. Some of these are private companies, so they don't really report. But just so you can kind of know where they're at, it's uh, Amway Global is the biggest one in the U.S. Okay. It's about like eight, uh, almost nine billion dollars at this point. Uh, Herbalife is second. It's uh, about five and a half billion dollars in the in the U.S. Um, you have, uh, I think Avon, which is more like beauty type mm-hmm. products, female-based products, and they do have men's stuff. But um, I think that one was uh, three and a half. Um, billion, and then you have what do we got here? 
uh, Mary or Mary Kay, you have new skin. So you're getting into like, you have, you kind of have a mixture. Amway right. has some supplements and things like that. So you have kind of a, a, a two, two that would be more considered what we're, we're talking about, but we're talking about billions with a B, not millions. Yeah. So these are, are much bigger uh, businesses than if we're talking about somebody that's doing 50 million or something like that. That that's you know rounding error. Right. Let's these, put that in perspective. Right. Let's put that in perspective. Yeah. A company like Glombia Sports Nutrition, who owns brands like Optum, uh, BSN. I think they just purchased Slim Fast. They have a, a plethora of, of brands. That is worth what? I think you just recently did some earnings report on this. I mean, they're worth roughly give or take. Yeah, just the I think just the um, the performance brands. So we're not talking about. They have a much bigger piece of their pie, which is more of like the, they own cheese and dairy right. and, and a bunch of things. But, um, I think it's, uh, somewhere approaching like a one and a half billion dollars or something. That's like the portfolio. So just that's barely um, a billion, like just yeah, over yeah. a billion. So put that in perspective when you're, when you're thinking Herbalife is a $5 billion company in just the United States, just here. And they're killing it in India and all these other malnu- malnourished parts of the world because they're selling things for super cheap. So the similarities between, Let's just use Herbalife and Abacare versus, say, you know, the Redcon ones of the world or whatever out there. The affiliate programs, like the ambassador yeah. programs, is the, the biggest similarity between the two. You get paid a commission to push. You're not selling physical products. So there's where the difference is. For most, most affiliates or ambassadors or tier operators or whatever you want to call yourself, you don't actually keep the inventory at your house like you do with Herbalife and Abacare. You're giving out a code for a discount in which you get kicked back. It, that's smart marketing. I get it, but it's very similar to what the MLMs are doing. So sports nutrition companies looked at what these big guys are doing and be like, we can, we can incorporate that in what we're doing um, as word of mouth. Because if you think about like PPC, Google AdWords, a company like Redcon One or Ghost or whoever or Nutribio or ProSups, whatever, they pay per click. So they don't even necessarily – and you can also pay per conversion, which is going to be a little bit higher. But the amount of money that you're paying Google is probably similar, if not more, than what you're paying an affiliate because the affiliate is only being paid when a conversion actually takes place. So they can put their code out there. They can put their link out there a million times. And if only 20 people buy as a brand owner, you just got a million impressions, but you're only paying for 20 of them because that's where the conversion happens. So that is a very close similarity between multi-level marketing companies and the big, or the sports nutrition companies that we know of in our space that we kind of cover. I think that's the biggest similarity. I know there's several others as well. Yeah, that was one that I, I mentioned right off the bat because, yeah, I mean, the difference is that those ambassadors or tier operators or whatever they're called, they don't physically buy the product and then resell it at a you know a wholesale margin type mm-hmm. of a situation. Um, they don't stock the product. They don't do that. So there are some distinct differences, but it at the core, it's about one-to-one transactions. So you're trying your best to get commerce to one-to-one. That's where everything is moving at this point. Even that's what's driving influencer marketing at this point is that people want to get as close to the consumer as possible. The way to do that is people are attaching themselves to personalities, um, to people one-to-one commerce. So MLM companies, that's what they've thrived on for decades is that they have local people in their community, connectors within the community that go out sell a bunch of products and get their friends, their family, whatever, to also buy into the system. Then they also sell products. And then all of a sudden they blanket areas based as far as they can from a one-to-one perspective. So it's not all that much different than what is trying to be done just in commerce as a whole. They're just doing it more digitally and more, they're taking away the element of having to um, invest in the product, invest in the inventory. Like you have no downside other than diminishing your influence to your audience. Yeah, uh, I mean, exactly. So um, do I, f- now I'll tell you this, Josh, I, I personally can't stand the affiliate programs either. Now, the reason why I can't stand them is because I run a platform in which the affiliates come in there and they post their codes and links all over the place, trying to take advantage of something that I've created and built because they're too lazy to go out and do it themselves. So that bugs me. But um, it, other other similarities, I guess, would be, I mean, yeah, they're still a dietary supplement. They're in like categories in which the, all the main players play in. Like Herbalife makes a pre-workout. It's called Herbalife 24. Abacare makes a pre-workout. It's called Sparks, and I think they have something else too. Um, so like the categories are very similar. The main, I mean, I, for me, like similarities, I mean, there are, they are sold in brick and mortar stores. I've walked in the brick and mortar stores and seen Isogenics. I've seen Abacare being sold at gyms, but again, it's kind of like a backhand way for that gym to make money because it's like, hey, I also have this MLM thing over here inside my gym. I can make revenue in two different ways. Um, but beyond that, just off the top of my head, I can't think of many more similarities right away, and you probably can. 
So it's, um, I think one that I mentioned as well, and this is a little bit kind of in the future and what people are aspiring, uh, like traditional sports nutrition brands are aspiring to do and what MLM companies do well already is that they're getting their um, inventory very close to the consumer. So they generally have like a, um, a local hub that people go and pick their stuff up at. Um, they have, to your point, I think they have like health clubs or whatever mm -hmm. that they um, create as a community area for people to come and learn and, and, and use products, try products. You know, it's one of those things where it's, it's driving awareness or whatever. But what I think you're going to see or what you're already seeing with traditional sports nutrition brands is that the more that we move towards like foods and beverages and things that need to be as close because they're heavier and they lower margin, they need to be closest to the consumer. So they need to be in more distribution points. They need to be, um, you know, is that third party f fulfillment areas? Is that just uh, with just with the Amazon, you know, think about how many um, fulfillment houses, distribution centers they are opening on a monthly basis. Like they're already doing that, but in a more localized, like a way, uh, uh, you know, kind of an independent way where they're shipping these to like, you know, probably in the Twin Cities where you're at or, or Austin where I'm at is like there's probably five or six of them within the communities where they ship the stuff to. And then they basically then it's really close to the probably 15 or 20 mile radius in which those products are going to be uh, consumed at. Mm -hmm. So that's one of those things where you're seeing, again, sports nutrition brands or just food beverage CPG brands start to take some of the lessons of this like micro shipping point, trying to get as close to the customer as possible because you – when somebody wants something, they want to get it quick, um, and you want it to be as close as possible so you can make the most amount of profit and, and margin out of those. Um, another one that I, I mentioned was a lot of their kind of use of now adding like education or, or doing it in a way that's like they're doing it through an app or through some of their physical people. But um, you see this with traditional sports nutrition brands, like with social media, um, you see them going out to like regional um, GNC educational events or, or things like that. They're trying to um, explain uh, the functionality of their products and they're trying to, to win people over in which that is. I mean, I think that that is a commonplace regardless of what functional uh, CPG brand it is. It could be multi-level marketing brands, it could be traditional brands, whatever, like you're still selling a very functional based product. And the ways you market those things are not all that different. It's not like uh, they don't, these brands, you know, uh, Herbalife or, um, you know, Am Amway or uh, any of those other ones, like they're not taking a very uh, harsh or, or kind of a hardcore uh, approach that you don't see a lot of like unique kind of branding uh, type of things. It's very mainstream, very lifestyle, yeah. very much whatever. And that kind of goes into uh, another point of what I kind of mentioned in that video was around like just the way that now sports nutrition brands are thinking about the way that they look, uh, they appeal. It's no longer about trying to uh, be the most loud and hardcore and black and crazy, whatever. And you still see a lot of that. I mean, mm -hmm. that's that's still commonplace, but you're seeing a lot more brands start to go more lifestyle, more mainstream. How do I make sure that I can appeal to the new set of buyers that are coming into the market, these new consumers? Um, and this is right in the wheelhouse of what MLM companies are doing. You see yeah. that like an Herbalife one, it's very like basic whites and greens or, or their sport line is black and green, but it's very easy to kind of like, you know, see it and you, you don't really get turned off by it. You're just like, hey, you know, I, I could pick this up. This is good. You know, whatever. This is for me. It doesn't give you one of those thoughts. Maybe me or you, it gives a thought to, but for most people that are looking at it, they're not getting a visceral reaction saying, this isn't for me. Right. I say the, the last similarity that I can think of too is sort of like their pricing model on their on their websites as well. If you look at Herbalife, for example, like their pre-workout I think is, is priced at eighty two dollars for something. I think it's twenty five servings for eighty two bucks. Like that's that's asinine, right? But there are brands out there who uh, intentionally price their products high on their websites because they're trying to encourage you to walk into a brick and mortar store to purchase the product or buy it through a different retailer. So. In this case, like Herbalife has it priced at 80 bucks because they want you to buy it through a distributor. So a distributor can take that $80 price point, go to their friends. They can buy that product for maybe you know, 25, 30 bucks from Herbalife. So they make a good margin right there. They buy it for 25, 30 bucks. They go to their friend down the street and say, hey, look, this thing retails for $82 on their website. I'm going to sell it to you today for 60. You're saving 20 bucks while at the same time I'm making 40 bucks or 35 bucks on that. And Herbalife is making a ton of money. And I'm able to pay those upward streams of commissions to all my friends who just recruited me. So like I said a lot there, but that that right there is a huge difference within your multi-level marketing companies versus your traditional sports nutrition companies is there's revenue streams on two different two different ways to, to earn revenue. If you are a 
a distributor, I, let's, just, let's just use that word, distributor for one of these companies, right? The first way is you can make margin on the physical product that you purchased from the corporate company that you just resold to friends, families, neighbors, whoever. The second way that you're making money is if you recruit a team underneath you, which is where you're going to start seeing that multi-level, why they call it that, and when they make sales, you make a commission on whatever they sell. And then when they recruit people and those new people sell something, the stream of commission goes upwards. So there's a – I realize, Josh, that every documentary has an agenda, right? There's always an agenda. But there's a really good one on Netflix. It's called Betting on Zero. And I don't know if, if you watched it, um, those out there listening or watching this – I urge you just to watch it. Now, keep an open mind because, again, there's an agenda with this. But it really does a good job of painting the picture in terms of, like, how MLMs are structured to the point where if you're not on the top of the pyramid, we'll say that, um, chances of you making a living doing this is minimal. I believe the stats were, it's, you know, we, we're traditional, we're familiar with the 80-20 rule, right? Like, you know, 20% of the people are making 80% of the income. I believe with MLMs, it's like, Four percent or six percent of the population is making like ninety four percent of the income, and everybody else is making minimal or losing money. So, this whole idea that health and wealth it fucking irritates me so much because it just it's non existent within these companies, especially at this point. Unless you get in on the ground floor of something new, and if you don't have any morals to do that, I mean, in terms of product quality, then yeah, you can get rich. But if you want to become an Herbalife distributor today. You're never going to be able to make a business sustainable and, and make it a long-term revenue unless you open one of these nutrition stores or whatever you might do. It, it's, just, it's hurtful to see that. I want to bring it back to a few points. You made mention towards like the two revenue streams. The one, obviously, by just buying something at a wholesale and then selling it at a, at a retail price. That, you know, that's nothing wrong with that one. Nope. The, the opposite uh, one, the one that you talked about around like recruitment commissions or recruitment bonuses or whatever, that's – from the betting on zero, um, the whole thing with Bill Ackman and, and Parrish, uh, Parrish and, uh, I forget what the what the uh, yeah his his thing is called, but basically, uh, the FTC came out and said, you know, that's kind of where they drew the line and said, hey, like the act the actual business model, you know, it is what it is, and, and it's maybe not technically um, illegal. Uh, what is illegal is if you're making money from recruitment um, commissions. That's what kind of deems this like a pyramid type of a thing. And that's where they've changed a lot of what needs to be done. So you're still getting this like upward stream of, of, of profit that has nothing. That's more that's been baked into the way that the business is um, set up. Now, what they don't want to come and what was happening was a lot of these people were making money. They were um, going after people that and selling them a dream that they could never cash. So right. they were basically saying, hey, or, hey, distributor, uh, open this. It costs you $6,000 and, you know, do all these things. I'll teach you how to do it where it was not going to happen for them. Like they thought it was going to be successful. But that person that recruited them, they were getting a, a equal 6000 bucks or whatever that is. And most people were making the majority of their money from recruitment, not from the resale of products. And that's what created this whole kind of mess. Right. And that's why the FTC st came in and was like, hey, this isn't this is going to work. You could still – you know, operate the way you're operating and, and put profits upward towards the, you know, the higher level of people that recruited you. There's no problem with that. That's like, you know, if, if you think about this in a traditional business sense, like senior leadership, sales guys on the floor, like those senior leadership are making money off of that because okay. they're getting a quarterly profit. Uh, maybe they have stock options. They have whatever it is. Like th this isn't anything different than other people. It just looks a little bit different because it's a, it's a set in stone way percentage wise. Hey, you're going to get 3% of this sale and it goes upwards. Like it's a little bit different than, than traditional models. And that's probably what people have problems with. But, um, you talked about, again, you talked, and, and I'm sure we're going to probably talk about this a lot because I know this is where your hot button is mostly at is around like product quality mm -hmm. and product, um, just like costs, like the economics behind products. And that was a kind of a big piece of my video because I wanted to make sure people understood that, yeah, there are some uh, very noticeable things. If you're in the industry for a while, the products are much um, cheaper made than things you'd see on the shelf and usually at a higher price point. Um, but what I wanted to pe well, people to notice is that Herbalife specifically, you have a huge amount of like economies of scale. I mean, we're talking again, billions of right. dollars. So the way that you could purchase anything from a contract manufacturer side, or in their case, I think it's 60 or 70%, they actually own their own manufacturing. Yeah, really so again, yeah. you have 
you have, you're stripping away all of the costs that a normal sports nutrition brand has to deal with. So yeah, you're making a good amount of profit um, that you have to pay upwards in, in the way that the thing is structured. Like if you look at just their EBITDA, like it's not much different. I think it's, you know, they have a mandate where it has to be in a certain range. So it's not like they are out there like making 50 points uh, as an EBITDA and they're, they're five or 10 times uh, bigger than anybody else in profitability. They do have a kind of a more cheap, cheaper made product and that's just comparable to the market and traditional. But then you also have this just cost driving that's going down because of the contract manufacturing that they own and just the economies of scale. You go out and just negotiate procurement on you know, protein, on whatever. Like It's not like you're at the uh, huge amount of, of, of swings that you have with just the commodity market if you're a small brand and your contract manufacturer is passing things down to you. You can actually hedge a lot of that depending on how good you are with your procurement. So they're a much different business. They're a much more complex business. And why I wanted to make sure people understood that is because if you're looking at this from an angle of you know maybe a red con or whatever, like they're not doing any fraction of that. Mm -mm. Like that's not what an, a, a small business does. Um, this is a much, this is a billion dollars. This is a large business. So they are doing things that are effective and, and useful to their profitability. But what you're going to be talking about, I know you're going to get super hot about is that why not make the product a little bit better then? Like if you're, if you're, if you're getting 20% off the top because you own your main, own your manufacturing, or whatever, why don't give that back to the consumer? I assume that's where you're going to go with this, Well, right? no, because I know they can't. I know they can't because they, to, in order to operate the way that they want to operate, to be able to go back to shareholders and, and turn a profit and be investable as a publicly traded company, you can't do that. You have to make a shitty product. Simple as that. And you're too nice, Josh. You say lower quality and you're, you're very nice. But it is a shitty product in terms of performance enhancing supplementation. It's not good. Now, here's the thing. Like we've done reverse – engineering on these products in terms of what it would cost to do like low minimums through a contract manufacturer locally and the cost to make some of these products even when we pay for the label and container is like three dollars and 87 cents i mean it's like super 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 small now take into account like you said their scale and what they can do they own a lot of the processes they own many of the farms that they get like their protein from like they own that as well so like their costs are very minimal. Why is it? So if they, they're paying, say, $2 a product and they're selling it for 80 on the website, a distributor buys it for, for 20 they just made $18 profit on a $2 product. That person can go turn to the, sell it to their friend for 40 bucks. They just made another 20 bucks. Like, but you have to pay those upward streams of commissions, which then depletes the margin that you just made. So I totally get why they make a shitty product. I don't ever anticipate, expect them to make it better. If they did, they would probably be out of business at some point. Like it would drain them. But like even speaking with somebody in the – like Mark Glazer, CEO of Nutribiome, he looked at doing an MLM at once upon a time in his life too. And he said there is literally no way you can have a successful multi-level marketing company without creating a very inexpensive, low-quality product and selling it at an increased rate. So that if you're out there and you're thinking about buying any type of product within an MLM structure, chances are that that product is of lower quality in a nice way that Josh puts it or I'll put it shitty quality, Okay. That's not just sports nutrition. That can be makeup. That can be skincare. And I know there are people out there who swear on some of these skincare things, okay? And I'm not familiar with that field, so I'm not going to even speak on it. But it, again, it costs them literally nothing to make this stuff because that's how you, you're able to make some money. Um, so no, I don't expect that. I want people to become educated on what they're buying because – if my neighbor is selling me something, what credentials does that neighbor have? Now, the person watching or listening to this podcast can say, well, what credentials do you have, Ryan? You don't have a degree in this. And Herbalife has a, has a doctor on their board of directors. And I believe this was a line, moved in the, a line used in the movie, uh, Betting on Zero. It's like, of course, if you have somebody on payroll, they're going to say what the company wants them to say. This is a high nutritious product. It's well formulated. It is formulated by a doctor. Okay, that's all factual information. If the doctor formulated that product, that's not a lie. It's a fact. And then people are going to buy that product because, oh my God, a physician formulated this thing. It must be good. Does not mean that it's good at all. Not even a little bit. And the fact that their education system is so flawed that people are going and telling other people, all you need to do is replace two meals a day with these shakes and you're going to be losing weight. Well, of course you're going to be fucking losing weight because you're replacing a whole calorie dense meal with a liquid diet, like if anybody in the world ever tells you that you're better off replacing a meal with a shake, you should slap them in their face, kick them in the nuts, and run, a run as fast as you can away from that person because it's not accurate. 
But that's what these companies do because they want to sell you more of their product. So if anybody ever on social media posts these words, hit the unfriend button, hit the block button, interested in learning how to make more money each month, DM me for details. How about I block you and I never speak to you ever again? How about that, Josh? Yeah, the credentials you're talking about, I was, I kind of was thinking, I mean, what gets everybody and why this is successful is, is there's a trust element because if somebody that's your friend, your family member or whatever is selling you something, odds are, at least you, you default to, they're not going to try to take advantage of me. No, and you that's, can't say no. You can't, yeah. So it's, it's one of those things where if somebody's telling you, you know, how great this product is and how well it's worked for them and all these different things, especially if you're an uneducated or you're maybe not even all that um, passionate about that area and you don't look into it yourself, you just say, cool, like, I, yeah, I'll, I'll try it out. That sounds good. You don't even know the price points in which other products are at or anything. So to you, it's not like you're getting ripped off. You're just like, cool. So what they're doing is, is, is really taking advantage of, a, um, of an error in, in just the way that human society is. You know, mm -hmm. Certain areas, you have blind spots. Uh, one of them happens to be in the areas of usually science and health and, and things of that nature because it's such a complex area that there's um, there's some people that have a lot of information about it, but those people are few and far between. Most people are just kind of riding by uh, the seat of the pants and trying to figure this out, and that's what people prey on. And, and it's not necessarily like – it's not like they teach you that. It's that – that's just human nature. That's right. just kind of how it happens. And – they're built. They're they're using that trust based around proximity. Now you're building a platform based on trust around your reputation, mm -hmm. which is a lot different. Which is what also a lot of like you know influencers in general are. They're using that influence. Hopefully, if it's built on trust and, and reputation, they're doing the same thing by saying, "Hey, use my 10% off coupon. This whatever. You don't might not know anything about that product or whatever. You just trust that that person said it's great, and you're right. going to try it. So it's it's kind of the same same thing, but in a much different uh, way. And um, it's it's unique. I mean, you talked about like the way that people are um, on your social media. I, I haven't, it, it's been a long time since anybody's ever talked to me about or approached me. I think maybe I have that kind of look that's like, don't fuck with me. I, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> My girlfriend always says it's that uh, I have that look that like people don't want to talk to me. Like I just look like I'm mean business. Like, d like I, I don't have time for chit chat. So I don't think anybody of my friends uh, you know, even try to contact me about that. I think they'd also know that I'd probably just blast them with with facts and logic yeah. that they would probably be it wouldn't be waste your time. Like when somebody calls you um, on the phone and it's like trying to telemarket them, they always say like the best way to do it is just to waste their time because eventually they, they get so frustrated they hang up. It's kind of like the same way. They'll never contact you again because they know you just like wasted their time. They're yeah. trying to get you to like get through the script as quick as possible. Yeah. So it's kind of in that in that same way. But it's uh. I mean, if you were to classify a type of person that gets involved with MLM, like what kind of person is? I know where I grew up, and I'm, I'm assuming where you grew up, like a lot of people got into MLM companies. They got sold that dream. Yeah, I mean, you, you mentioned just one word there. They're dreamers and they're, and they're uninformed. It's, I mean, as simple as that because they, especially specifically within like dietary supplements or sports nutrition, it's kind of the perfect world for an MLM if you think about it because <clears throat> you're selling a health and beauty product or something that's going to help you live better. Everybody... Everybody in the world, when they look in the mirror, they always think that they should look better. They want to look better. Even if they're the most beautiful person in the world. We're so mentally fucked in this, in this world that we're such a, so, so self-conscious of our image, we can always be prettier. We can always be skinnier. We can always be more muscular. Like, I do it every day. I, I, I'm a self-admitted – I'm not a narcissist by any means, but, like, I look at myself and I constantly judge myself every single day. It's unhealthy, but as human beings, it's what we fucking do. So you are selling a product to somebody who just wants to be better, healthy. They don't know anything about the product, but they're willing to spend money on it if there's this false guarantee that's going to make them uh, live better or look better. Second to that is everybody in the world hates their fucking boss. And not, not maybe not literally, but they hate working for someone. Yeah. Everybody in the world wants to work for themselves. This idea of the American dream of owning your own business and becoming a millionaire or being a self-sustainable business in which you can pay your bills – you are selling these people a product that can make them prettier and a dream that can make them rich. It is a, it, it is a perfect storm for Herbalife and Avocare. I get it. Like it's, in terms of money-making, it's brilliant. I, I've always said it's, yeah. it's a brilliant money-making scheme or whatever you want to call it. I always come at it in terms of like, yes, the product quality. Here's what you know, people should be informed on what they're buying. And because then at the end of the day, then when it doesn't turn out the way that it's supposed to, 
they turn around and they collaborate together with everybody who kind of gotten fucked by the system and they sue Herbalife for a billion dollars in damages. Well, no offense, you should take some fucking responsibility as a consumer as well. Like, I mean, when I and I reported on like the billion dollar lawsuit or whatever it was in the Miami courtroom, I think it was last year. Um, that that one article on my website, Josh, had a million views in two days on my website. Like, my it went viral, and I had. A bunch of Herbalife people reach out to me, bash me, and literally just defend the product because they're so uneducated and uninformed, they just don't know. And I don't fault them necessarily. I mean, I, I fault them for not like taking responsibility, but the company obviously has part of that too. But I, when it comes to actually not achieving the said dream you were promised, whose fault really is that at the end of the day? Like you as a consumer should, be, should take responsibility for what we do. Our decisions that we make, we're always so quick to point the finger and blame somebody else. And yes, maybe to some extent they are responsible for selling something that was never necessarily true but as a consumer of that information why not fact check it why not do your research why not do your homework and that includes a lot of different things so i think that everybody i don't think it's just herbalife at fault i think it's people who get caught up in it and get fucked by the system it's everybody's fault that's involved in it so in terms of making money i think it's a, a phenomenal business strategy within a category or field that works because people are weak-minded and that's not being mean. It's just a, it's fact. Where we are weak minded people have, for the most part. Um, but in terms of product quality and being passionate about trying to provide a consumer something that's actually going to potentially give them that extra five to ten percent of a performance boost, it's shit. It's garbage. So that is where I get hot and heated about it. I hate seeing people taken advantage of, but I also hate seeing people spend more time researching a brand new television set that they're going to put in their house than something that they're going to put inside their body. That frustrates me more than anything. Yeah, I think our platforms are obviously a little bit different in terms of the focus in which, um, you know, who follows us and who's kind of consuming our information. Yours is very much focused on the end consumer, which um, that's why you kind of get hot on, you know, that, the product quality, those types of things where, you know, I, I don't, I agree. I, I mean, I, I don't want people to come out with crappy products, but I, I kind of think about this in the sense that you have a supercomputer in your in your pocket that honestly you don't even have to type anything anymore you just ask a question and take and a picture a, of it yeah somebody an ai uh, robot will tell you what you need to know so it's at this point where there's really no excuse for anybody to not be at least marginally um, you know informative on on things so it's i i don't necessarily get too hot about that one because me as a consumer, if I get taken advantage of, it's I always go, it's my fault because I didn't do the research or I didn't, you know, whatever it is. Where I kind of get hot at is more from the business side, more from like the distributor standpoint because when you go into a business, when you go into running a business and somebody's trying to sell you on how to run a business, there's not as much information out there. Now there's generalizations, there's whatever, but from an individual variable standpoint, there's a lot of things that you can't really just research and figure out. Mm -hmm. You have to um, trust yourself and you have to trust the person that's selling you all, a lot of this stuff. And that's where I kind of get a little bit upset about because that's where people are getting sold these dreams to, to build a business. I think the facts that I saw somewhere around like 90% of people start to be a distributor because they want to make more money. Um, so that it's, it's driven around money. People understand that that's the driver, that's the hot button. So they make sure that they kind of reverse engineer their pitch to that. And then what you find out is 75% or so either lose money or break even, which is, you know, not that bad if you think about just the grand scheme of like business, you're like, oh, it's, you know, that's cool, 25% are doing something. But if then you look, you drill down to like, how much does that 25% make? I think it's more than 50% of it's less than five grand. So it's like yeah. pretty much breaking even as well. So then you're starting to get to where like in the first year, you're just not making much, if any profit or money or anything, but you're sold this idea that you're going to make all this money. And I'll, kind of circle this back to like what I was talking about with like personal accountability. And I, I think there is a level of that with anything that you put into. Um, I think you need to know yourself and know, hey, am I a leader? Am I somebody that's going to connect people and I'm going to be that person that's out there hustling, working for myself, you know, whatever. The stuff we were talking about with being an entrepreneur. I mean, either you have or you don't. Mm -hmm. You can't be a entrepreneur, especially in this business. So then, then all of a sudden, then you default to all the other kind of areas. Are you somebody that's like uh, just kind of working when somebody is watching you? Are you somebody that's just wasting a bunch of people's time, or you're just somebody that just doesn't do any of the work. All those classifications of people are not going to make any money in this game because you're not going to put out the self-directed uh, effort to get you to where you need to. So I'll say that I get more passionate towards that side because mm -hmm. I work with a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of them that even are pre-revenue. So a lot of times 
you do get sold a lot of things early on and you have to be able to cut through the crap. But in this point, like they're telling you a script in terms of how well you're going to do and, and why not believe somebody that's doing a billion dollars? You think, huh, you know what? That's great. Yeah, I would love to be able to make a fraction, a fraction of a fraction of that. That'd be great. So it's kind of a, I don't know, a little bit different of a uh, self-awareness, I guess, or just like kind of an area of, of where people, I think, get caught up into it because they're so focused on making money that it blinds everything else. Yeah. I mean, I can tell you right now, I could make a fuck ton of money selling this stuff at this point. Yeah. I have the look, I have the charisma, I'm great at sales, but I won't sell my soul to do it. I love money. I would swim in money if I could, but I'm, I'm not willing to uh, basically go against everything that I stand for, that I, that I believe in to do it. So that's, that's my thing. That's why I get hot about it. Um, if people are making money, making a I have a friend whose wife does really well with isogenics. They make over six figures a year. I mean, I don't go to dinners with them. I don't hang out with them much anymore. But at the same time, like, if you if you can do that and like you have that personality to do it, God bless you. I uh, I don't believe in it, and then I never will. So that's my take on it. That's why I get so hot and passionate about it. I'm going to make money more of. Um, and I'm not saying it's dishonest. It's not a dishonest way of making money. Because even some of these people who are making a lot of money, they probably don't fucking know either. They probably have no idea like what they're selling really in the scheme of things is, is, is trash. They're still selling a product. And I think we should have – one thing too people are probably asking as we wrap this up is like how is this different than a pyramid scheme? Like why does the FTC allow this stuff to continue? It's and From my understanding, like a pyramid scheme does not involve an actual physical product. It's like back in college I got recruited to sell this VoIP cell phone plan that wasn't built yet in my area, but it was coming. So recruit all these people, get their recruitment free fees, and you'd make money. The VoIP plan was never fucking coming. I was selling something that was non-existent. That is where it was a pyramid scheme. That these companies actually involve a physical product is kind of how they get around it, and that's why they're called multi-level marketing companies, and that's why they're legal. Am I correct on that, Josh? Yeah, I mean, there's an exchange of goods, and, and it's not like a dishonest thing. I mean, this is something that, though, might not seem uh, appropriate to some people if they have a conventional thought of business, uh, but it's not illegal in the sense because you are um, selling somebody a good, um, they're paying a price for it. it obviously, the, the market decided what that price was because somebody decided to buy it, but what gets it into the pyramid scheme is like what you're talking about with the recruitment right. and things like that, where there's no real... Um, you know, exchange of goods. It's like you're only making a good amount of your profit by like churning out basically businesses that are never making money. That's that's a totally different way. And in, in this context, now there's a ton of different definitions like for financial in instruments and stuff like that. Sure. But we're talking mostly like consumer goods here. Yeah. So I mean, every, we'd love to hear your opinions on multi-level marketing companies. You can hit us up on Facebook, obviously. Uh, that's where a lot of our social engagement happens. Two guys, one shaker cup. Um, I'd love to hear, I mean, we, it, hopefully we have some people that have either been distributors before or people who are currently distributors today. And by all means, be passionate about your point of view. I don't care. We will I'll go to war with you. I don't care. I mean, that's kind of what I do. But uh, obviously, two guys, one shaker, couple over at Facebook. You can follow us um, on our social media channels. Obviously, hit the subscribe button. We're on iTunes, Spotify, and YouTube. And you can help us out with the algorithm by writing us a review. If we're a five-star podcast, hit the five stars. If, uh, if I'm a, a one-star host, then give me a one-star. But uh, and, and I'm sure I'm probably, you know what? The Herbalife distributors are going to be one-star in the shit out of this yeah. podcast. Yeah. But uh, I got, it is what it is, Josh. It is what it is.